Right, and I've got the live chat in from. I've popped out the chat from from the tube, so it might go quicker here. Right, hello, up yet? Evening, peeps. All right, okay. Oh, here he's not. Good evening, good evening, good evening. News from Clasper Mansions. We had a catastrophe today, a huge catastrophe at Clasper Mansions. I've run out of wine. Oh my life. So tonight, following the show, you will hear the dulcet sounds of a bottle of Bombay Sapphire being opened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's it i'm uh, i'm falling back onto the gin tonight and then i'll be falling somewhere else probably anyway how are you all i'll just have a quick look at the chat and see who's in okay we've got dylan and he's in me here joy's here evening joy eva's in i know stace is in uh jeff's in herb's in anybody else Oh, Nixon as well. Yeah, Nixon a little earlier on. Mike as well. Grand. Right, guys, what we're doing tonight, <coughs> I'm going to show you how I use a ball gouge. I know you've all seen me use a ball gouge before, but I'll try and give a, a bit of an explanation while I'm going on. <coughs> bit of a disclaimer first. This is how I use a ball gouge. These are the angles I use on the ball gouge. Other people like to use different angles. They like to have a different grind on the ball gouges. That's fine. That's grand. Whatever you're happy with. This is what I'm happy with. What I'll do, I'm going to change over the camera. I've been doing some drawing as well. Oh. So I'm going to change over the camera and I'll get the whiteboard up so you can have a look. The first thing I'm going to explain is the anatomy of a ball gouge. Be right back. Evening guys, nice to have you in. Hope you're all well. Right, I've got the overhead camera on and I'm just going to put my whiteboard onto the bed bars. If it will fit. There you go. Can you see that okay? I'm getting a flicker up, a bit of a flicker on the camera here, but I think that's because of the whiteboard. Right, pencil. Love you to find a bloody pencil when I need one. Right, the anatomy of a bull gouge. We'll have the tool. This is the flute here. And as you can, you can probably be able to tell, now we'll show you actually on a gouge. It's quite a deep flute. And that's what bull gouges have. They have quite a deep flute. This is the cutting edge. This is the bevel, which everybody harps on about, rubbing on the wood as you come into the cut. And this is the heel. And the... <laughs> <laughs> that's just deal whispering in me here and uh, this is the heel now the heel on a ball gouge can sometimes cause some problems depending on what type of grind you got on there depending how deep the ball is that you're going to cut i'll come on to that a bit later on putting this in perspective with the ball gouge so you can get yeah i'll bring it up Evening, Christine and Michael. So that's basically what I'm, um, what I'm sure I'll turn that around. So it's, just, well, it's not the same way. That is the same. Yeah. Right. So what we're looking at there, you have the heel here. You've got the bevel there. You've got the cutting edge here. And this is the flute. And like I say, it is quite a deep flute. Now, either this afternoon on Nick's Live, asked me to explain the difference between a spindle gouge and the ball gouge, I'm buffering there. I did get a warning on um, StreamYard as I started to, to set this up today, saying that obviously because of the because of the um, the lockdown and everything, and more people using the internet, and a lot of people doing lives and things like this, 
that um, there may well be some some problems with StreamYard. Plus, I think everybody knows my internet is not the best. So we will just see how we get on. Right, that's the ball blank. It's a piece of silver piece of silver birch, and it is about two inches thick by just over 13 in diameter. I'll get this onto a better camera. Which one am I going to use? I was going to use that, but there's a hell of a lot of flicker on that. Does it? Let's just have another look at a, a different one. What's that one like? Grand. Right, so majority of the work I'll be doing tonight, I'll be using my which camera I'm on? That one. My usual Robert Sorby 3 8 ball gouge. Now that's a, another difference as well. In the UK, in the UK, when we measure the ball gouge, this is a 3 8 one. We measure across the flute. That's where we measure. In the States, when they measure a ball gouge, it's actually measured across the shank. So a three years ball gouge in the UK is different to a three years ball gouge in, sorry, in the States. Now what I'll just quickly do is get this rounded off. And then when I come onto the bottom of the ball, I'll start explaining how I tend to use it. I'll just set the speed. That's me up at about 750 revs there. Not better? Right, that's rounded off. There's a nice little bit of burr in this blank, which is going to look quite nice. Right, I'm just going to mark in, put the bloody pencil down again. I'm just going to mark in the centre. Right, before I start doing any explanations, just let me flatten off the the bottom.
got a couple of prezzies in the post today i've got the um the bowl that stay stayed last friday that arrived today and also a tub of wind of the big feeties wax so i'm going to be giving that a go tonight Well, it's a wax, that's right. Okay. Now, everybody talks about the bevel, which, like I said, is that part there, about the bevel rubbing. Now, if you actually have the bevel sitting on the bowl all day long, that's not going to do anything. You're perfectly safe having the bevel on the bowl like that. Now, when you are cleaning the bottom off, as I did there, I push from the outside going towards the inside. And when I push from the outside going towards the inside, I have the bevel pointing in the direction that I want to go. So if I had the tool like that and pushed in, the bevel is actually pointing in that way, so the cut would go in that way. If I had the bevel pointing that way and I went straight along, I'd be getting a scraping cut. I wouldn't be getting a, a proper cut. So you have the bevel going in the direction you want to go. Now you can either do a push cut like I did there, or you can actually do a pull cut like that. Now the thing with the pull cut is, again, if you've got the bevel sitting on the piece of wood like that, you can have that sitting there, like I said, all day long, you're not going to do any harm, you're not going to do any cutting. But once you start turning the tool towards you, start turning the tool over, for the purposes of tonight, if we had the flute straight up and down, that's 12 o'clock. And if I go anti-clockwise, it's going around 11, 10, everything like that. And if I go clockwise, it's going around 1 and 2. Now, if I just start this cut, I don't know if this will show up very well. I've got the bevel rubbing there. Nothing's happening. If I start twisting the tool around, I'm going to start getting the cut. And there, I'm getting the cut. And I think you can see there the lovely spiral shavings. I'll just show you them. The lovely spiral shavings are that are actually coming off. So that's me getting a very decent cut there. And the bevel is rubbing. It's only just, the bevel is just touching. So there's the type of shavings I'm getting. Now, Unlike carbide tools, when people use carbide tools, and don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against using carbide tools, because I've got some, and I do use them. But when people are using carbide tools, the same as if people are using scrapers, for one thing, you need to have the tool rest higher. It needs to be directly on centre or above centre, and the handle needs to be either parallel with the bed bars, or up from the bed bars if you use a scraper with the handle down like that because on scrapers there's realistically no pass it realistically again right be, because on scrapers there's no bevel as such you've just got the sharp edge if you're holding the handle down like that and you cut you're going to get a catch you're going to get a nasty catch it's going to flick the handle up you could do yourself some damage you are going to do do the wood some damage Evening Andy, with, I don't know if you can hear that, I've got birds up in the eaves of the workshop. Right, yeah, audience finally lost it, yeah, one of the two. Um, <laughs> right, don't, don't start me, don't start me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with, see, I've forgotten, I've forgotten where I was now. Right, with the gouge. Right, with the gouge, you have the tool rest below centre. So when you're actually finishing a cut, see, on the inside of a bowl, you're always finishing on the centre point, okay? So the handle is always down. You always have the handle facing down, unless the bed bars are getting in the way and you've actually got to lift the handle up. But as much as possible, you need to have the handle down. Now, like I said, you can do a pull cut. So I'll just rest the bevel on there. I'll bring it round, 
that's me just starting to cut there starting to bring that across evening Wayne thanks for coming in and Val um, the other thing to remember is is that a lot of the time when you're actually doing shapes especially on the outside of a bowl you tend to have the um, the tool locked in place so you've got it firmly on the tool rest you've got it into your hip and you've got it jammed there and it tends to be body movement I know that's not shown very well on camera but it does tend to be body movement when you're actually shaping the bowl um, I'll talk about clearing out the bowl obviously when I come to, to clear it out so what I'm going to do now I'm just going to put a, a shallow dish in here and then I'm going to form the tenon so this is going to be a push cut so I'm pointing the bevel the way that I'm wanting to cut so I'm just getting it in that's just starting to cut there I'm pointing it into the bowl not straight across the bowl so it's going into the bowl and you just start cutting. The bevel is rubbing, and I'm getting some very nice shading coming out there. Now, because of the type of wood this is, and the figuring in the wood, chances are I'm going to get a fair bit of tear out. It's quite a soft wood, silver birch, so I'm going to get a fair bit of tear out but I'll sort that later I'm just going to put a mortise in now I use a pair of dividers for putting the mortise in and if you are using a pair of dividers for putting the mortise in only use one of the points on the piece of wood okay and you have it on the piece of wood where the divider is going to be resting on the tool rest never put the other side in because that's going to flick it round and it can come back and again cause you some harm. So I'll just get. Evening, Graham. I'll just get that side up. Now, I'm using a different gouge here. This is a. Um... Let's see what size this is. This is a quarter inch ball gouge and it's actually it's this is one of my swept back oh that's going quite well on the level there this is one of my swept back gouges the angle are you that's what i didn't show you i didn't show you the angle did i i'll be able to show it easier on a half inch gouge i think probably should have done this when i had the overhead on let's see if i can sort this right I use what's called a 45 degree, 45 degree angle. So this gauge is set at 45 degrees. So my bevel there is set at 45 degrees. And if I turn that round, my cutting edge, oh, thumbs in the way there. My cutting edge is also set at 45 degrees. And I've got, I tend to use a fingernail ground grind rather than a swept back grind. That's purely my preference. A lot of people manage with a, a swept back grind very well. It's just that I prefer to have the, the, um, the, fingernail, the fingernail grind. I do have one gouge, which is actually set, and you, I think you can see that. That's called an English grind. This is a traditional grind that goes back a hell of a lot of years. Um, I think a lot of Americans call this particular grind a bottom feeder to get a nice cut on the, the bottom of balls. So we'll go back to the mortars. Oh, oh brilliant. Andy's doing his color of oranges again. Excellent. If anybody, if anybody hasn't seen Andy's clockwork oranges, you've got to watch them. If not, that's one thing that will cheer your deal. Right, now, for cleaning out the mortars, people use um, parting tools, you use scrapers, everything like that. If it works for you, that's fine. No problem whatsoever. It's just that I've got a preference for using a gouge when I'm doing this.
and I take it towards the centre first, and then I take it, I have a bit of difficulty now because I've got my camera tripods here, but then I'll take it back towards the edge. Evening, Glenn. Right, so I'll take that out towards the edge. Now, usually I use... Where's it going? I use a shaped scraper. Um, Rich, the beard time 16, the other week, um, made a, a small mortise and tool. I was just using mine yesterday. It's gone. I'll put it down. I hope there's so many tools in this one here. You know, the thing is, the burial hide everything as well. Oh, there it is. <laughs> right, so this is this is a, a small mortise and tool. So I've actually got the angle of my uh, chuck into there. And I can just get the edge cleaned up. Just put that straight in. Like that. Very, very similar to the one that um, that Richard made. So that's basically the mortar's done, and everything else will get cleaned up when I start doing the sanding. So now we're going to shape the outside of the bowl. And again, I tend to go, a lot of the time, I will start from the outside and start working my way around. All of my designs tend to be fairly simple, nicely curved, um, shapes. So again, I've I've got <laughs> deals making me laugh again. Right, I've got I've got the 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 gouge at a very steep angle there, and again I'm going to turn it. I'm on the bevel there. It's not cutting. Then I bring it into the cut. And that's me putting there. And it produces a very nice cut with lots and lots and lots of nice shavings. <laughs> yeah, there's a terminator in the garden. Jin's let the dogs out. I tell you, the last time Glenn and Joe were up here, uh, Glenn, Glenn was having an absolutely brilliant time with um, with Bryn outside because Glenn was going outside for his for his vape as he does, and Bryn the dog was following him outside and chasing the vape all over the place. He was, in fact, I think Glenn would probably tell you this. He was probably jumping as high as Glenn's head. Right, I do when I'm shaping the bowl, and I know other people do things differently, which is all well and good if it works for them. But I'll never go in from here when I'm shaping the bowl. You can do, it's just that wasn't the way that I was taught. Um, it tends to cut the fibers of the wood differently, and it's okay doing that as long as you do a finishing cut going this way. Um, Chris Fisher, the blind wood turner, explained this brilliantly with a, a pencil. Right, where's the, the green? The green is running across this way, okay? Now, if you see the point of the pencil here, right? So the green of this wood is running that way as well. Now, even because... How do you sharpen a pencil? So you go with the grain, but you're actually pushing through the fibers of the grain. Okay? So you're actually pressing down the fibers as you cut. So you get a nice clean cut. 
you don't sharpen a pencil coming back this way because you're going to rip those fibers out and that's one of the main reasons is why you tend to cut as much as you can with going with the grain apart from, uh, going with the grain not against the grain and that's the same in spindle turning as well so again level on turn until you start getting the cut and that's you getting the cut there Well, the other thing I tend to forget as well is that not everybody has got a lathe as powerful or as robust as this one. So they're not actually able to take very, very big cuts like I do. It doesn't really matter. You can take very, very small cuts anyway. So that's the, the type of shavings when you're taking very, very fine cuts. So I'll just carry on shaping the outside of the bowl now. What's a lovely grain in this wood? Now I'm actually getting very close to the bed bars here for doing this type of cut, so I'm going to have to change the style of cut in a minute. see how it's shaping up the chattering you heard there was when i was hitting this bit here there's a wee bit of a knot there and a bit of a burry part so i was getting a wee bit of chatter there i'm just going to shape this bottom bit again a wee bit and now i'm going to do a push cut so again, I'm getting the bevel lined up to go in the direction that I want. So that the bevel is actually pointing that way, up this slope. So if you want to put some sort of shape into a foot or anything, get the bevel pointing more towards the top of the bowl and then just bring the handle round like that. And that's what I'm just doing there. Just forming a wee bit of a foot and then I'll go back to doing the, the shaping of the bowl. John. Interesting. He has got some stickers with that on. 
Am I right there, Glenn? Have you got some stickers with the Yorkshire kit on? Yes, Roy, I was explaining about that earlier on. That's... That's one of my uh, gouges with an Irish grind. I tend to use... I tend to stick to the, uh, the fingernail grind uh, for a lot of stuff that I do, Joy. But that's just personal preference. Um... If anybody does get a chance to visit um, Glynn's place down in Scarborough, um, you'll find that all of his, or the majority of his bull gouges uh, are all Irish grind. Woodcraft. All right, no, I'm sorry. Evening, Mr. Bear. bit off the diameter here I've got a there's just a small piece of bark there which I'm going to have to get rid of so I might as well do that with this cut There's quite a few ridges on this at the moment, so I'm going to go back to my small quarter inch Irish grind just to do one final finishing cut. I might just, yeah, do the foot of this a bit differently. Oh, good. Stephen Devin. Now, whenever I do a, a final finishing cut, I always try and do it in a water, if I can. So that's our ready for sanding.
You're excused. Well, I'll just quickly sand this. Right, the other thing I should have mentioned as well, a lot of people do use um, a scraper at an acute angle or a negative rate scraper for doing the finishing cut. Um, as a preference, I don't, but again, that's just personal preference. I don't see anything wrong with doing that. It's just that I'm not keen. And that's the only reason I don't do it. Well, like I said, Nick, in answer to what you just said there, a lot of people actually, as a preference, use the scraper after the ball gouge um, to actually get that finishing cut. And with the scrapers these days, I mean, especially with the negative rake scrapers that you, the, you get these days, you can get an absolutely tremendous cut with a negative rake scraper. It's just like, like I said, I prefer uh, not to use them. And it's just a personal preference. So that was 80 grit, 120 grit, and I'm just going to finish off with 240. Evening, JP. Some rattle can cellulose standing sealer. It doesn't matter if I use or what sanding sealer you use, really, if you're just doing a, a basic bowl. Um, this happened to be the first can I picked up. That's a point that I did actually meant to send you the the burnt one from, from last week, JP. I'll get that organized in the next couple of days. I will be out on Friday. So I'll um I'll get it organized and I'll get that, that burnt piece that I did last week. I'll get that sent off to you. It'll probably need um a few more coats of, of lacquer on there, Jamie. So I'm using my usual Yorkshire grit. Get it well rubbed in while the lid is stationary. Other abrasive pastes are available. 
not as good nowhere near as good <laughs> but they are out there yeah Well, I've tried at least one of the other ones that's out there, and <laughs> it doesn't out. <laughs> it really doesn't. And before anybody asks or pulls me up about it, yes, I forgot to turn the speed down. For the initial rubbing in of the grit. But it's still working. Right, so I'm going to try a different finish tonight. This just landed today, so I haven't actually had a chance to, to use it yet. Uh, this landed in the post today. Let's see if I can get that. Food safe finish from Wayne of the Big Feeties. So this is... Who is that, sorry, Bill? Oh, Huey. Evening, Huey. So this is... Um, Wayne's own receipt. Food safe. He uses it on the the cutting and chopping boards that he does and cheese boards and things like that. And I think basically it's a mixture. It's a blend of mineral oil and beeswax. Yes, Eva, if you wanted to, you could eat food from this plate. The thing with using waxes and things is that you've got to be careful, actually, how you clean the plate afterwards. Well, that finishes nicely. Cheers, Wayne. Well impressed. Right, I'll turn it round. Sorry. Yes, mineral oil is food safe. Now, when you're putting the, your piece back into the chuck, hold it in the, the centre of the piece and push it straight on. Make sure we turn the chuck key the right way, otherwise it won't tighten. Have a look at that. That seems to be running very true. And always remember to tighten up the chuck in all of the chucking points. Just to make sure it's well tightened. I don't know if you can see it, but this has got a lovely great crack here, just where this buried bit is. So we'll see what comes out of that. Wayne, Wayne made it. Wayne, Mr. Bigfoot Woodcraft.
Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. Right then. Um, again, I'm straightening off the top. I've got the gouge at a fairly shallow angle for this. And again, the bevel of the gouge is pointing straight across because I'm doing it a straight cut. That's like, yeah, don't know. I've still got a bit here which hasn't been finished, so I'll get that done as well. tear out here have to try and get that sorted now as it is this edge here is very sharp stays this edge here is very sharp okay don't touch this edge while the piece is spinning or sand it off right so i've got a nice piece of burr here with a crack i've got a nice piece of burr there and i've got a little piece of burr there I've got some swirly green round here where that's why I'm getting the the tear out but I can get that sorted I think what I'll do I'll go for a, a fairly wide brimmed uh, dish I'm not doing any coloring on this tonight basically what I'm doing is um, just showing how to use the the gouge so uh, if I come in and start doing the dish let's have a look around about around about there so i'm just going to do a bit of shaping with um the the rim here Just change my gouge. I'm just going to take that sharp edge off. And just give it a quick sound. Just to round that over a bit, just in case I get a bit careless. And I'm just going to start fishing this in from here.
Right, I'm just going to put a small bead on here. See if I'm getting rid of any of that tear out. No, I've still got a hell of a lot there. Right, small gouge. Right, I'm going to start cleaning this out now. And now, again, I'm going to go downhill into this, not coming back up the hill. I'm going downhill into the bowl again the grain oh well and this is actually going quite a lot of different ways but in general you'll have your grain going across this way so you'll have end grain at the ends here and you'll have um the grain going all, along the length over there so i'm going to go in again point the bevel in the direction you want to put the go and put in that direction Now again, I've got the bolt, the gouge at a fairly shallow angle because the bed bars are in the way. <laughs> Cheers, please. Again, when I've watched other people um, doing the inside of bowls, um, there can be a tendency to have the bowl gouge parallel with the toolbars. Try not to do that. Um, like I said, if we have the flute straight up, that's 12 o'clock. So if I start tipping over this way, I'll start going 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. <coughs> You can cut right on three o'clock, but you will get a better cut if you cut it sort of between one and two. Now, you remember earlier on when I showed the picture and I was saying about the heel? Uh, there's my gouge. There we are. Uh, the heel of the gouge there, where this can cause problems, where the heel of the gouge can cause problems, and this is especially so with an Irish grind, but also with a fingernail grind as well. Once you start getting down to the bottom of a bowl, especially if it's on a deep bowl, on a dish like this, it's not so important. But if you've got a fairly deep bowl and you're trying to get down to the bottom of the bowl, what can happen is that once you get down to the bottom of the bowl, because of the grind, because of the Irish grind, you can come down and the, the heel, the heel of the gouge starts hitting on the ball after you've done the cut, which can cause lines on the on the, the ball as well. Just to bear that in mind.
And you don't actually have to have a lot of pressure with your your left hand or whichever hand it is that you, you're holding the, the tool onto the rest with. Because the wood is spinning in this direction, it's actually pulling the ball gouge down onto the, the tool rest anyway. So you can get nice decent cuts without having too much pressure actually on there. And if you get it into a, a good a good way, you can actually just use one hand. It's because I've got a sneaky deal in me ear sneak. That's why. Right. What metal is that gouge made of? All oh, right. The... Now, I'm not very sure of the quality of the high-speed steel. It is high-speed steel, but the colour of it, the golden colour, is because it's got a titanium nitrate coating on it. A green stain, um, it's M2 tool steel, but it has got a titanium nitrate coating on it, which actually makes the cutting edge last about three times longer than if it was just um, ordinary tool steel. Now, when you start getting towards finishing the ball, which I am here, I'll just take this nib out of the centre quickly, so I can see it. What I tend to do is actually start the cut way above centre, and then finish the cut. Right on the centre line. You've still got the edge of titanium. See on the inside there? You've still got the edge of titanium there. Right. Another thing that I don't do, and this is purely for safety reasons, is that, or I should say, I tend not to. I do do it sometimes, but not very often. I don't come back the other way. Now, right in the centre there, that's not turning very fast. And as you start going out towards the edge the speed of the wood is getting faster and faster if you're going in this way and starting to come out if you get a catch like nick did this afternoon the tool's going to dig in maybe you're going to ruin the ball i think the reason that nick's flew off this afternoon is because it actually had a crack in the bottom that's why it flew off but the chances are this gouge is going to come back out this way and head straight back towards you and it's very sharp 
and will probably cause some damage. So please, I know people like doing things the way they like to do them. Try not to do that. It's not very good practice. Right, I've got a couple of bits of tear out here, which I'm going to try and get sorted. And then I'll get some sanding done. No, you weren't, Nick. You were coming out from the centre of the ball. I was watching. Thing I should say as well is don't say, don't take everything I'm saying as gospel. There are a hell of a lot better turners than me out there, and people, a lot, some other people out there who can actually explain things a hell of a lot better. Um, have a look at um, Mike Walt did an original series of wood turning for beginners, and he's just actually started redoing them as well. Tear out there, which I am. Evening, Derek. Nearly gone. I might lose some of this bead because there's a bit of tear out on the bead as well. Down through the grits again.
Definitely a very nice piece of wood, this. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Joy, it is very nice. It's silver birch, Huey. <laughs> hey, I think you need better glasses than I've got, Mike. Derek lives, Derek lives not far from me. See, Derek lives not far from me. No, he doesn't. Oh, God, I forget where he's from. Where are you from again, Derek? Is it Dunsker? It was, Debbie, yeah, they, they are around this area, some absolutely huge birch trees. I bought some, a couple of um, bits of a, a silver birch uh, tree trunk uh, last year, and they were over 24 inches in diameter. All right, okay, sorry. Sorry, Debbie, sorry, Debbie, Mike, an answer to your question. Oh, between Dusker and Money Eye. It's not, it's not far from Dusker, do you? Get back on the lathe, David. All right.
All right then. There we go. Oh yes, I do like that. Right, I'm just going to clean out some wax from. Right, I'll see if I can get a a decent shot on the. Oh, there's a bit of wax on the back there. That's okay. A decent shot on the camera. I'm having difficulty taking photographs in the house at the moment because my bloody camera's packed in and I just don't know what's wrong with it. There you go. Not, hopefully not too much glare on that. Let's see what it's like on the, the overhead. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to change the camera. I'll do the overhead, see what it's like on there, see if I can get it without the, the glare. That's better. Turn around so you can. And the bottom, the bottom's even nice as well. Lovely feeling on the bottom as well. So there we go, guys. Um, So it's just coming up hour and 15 minutes um yeah so that's us i hope that i'll just change cameras so you can see my ugly mug this is where people leave in droves there we go there you go guys that's better than looking at me anyway so that's it nice silver birch ball it is it, it, it's, no, it's 12 inches by two inches um nice size good seller um certainly in the shops that i've got work in stuff around about that size sells really well i hope you enjoyed that uh, I will watch the video back uh, later on tonight so I can see the chat, see if there was any questions in there that I didn't answer during the live. And um, if there are any questions in there, I'll uh, send you a message with hopefully the answer or somewhere where you can find the answer. Um, so what am I doing next week? I think I'll do some turning for a change next week. <laughs> it is and it, it is anyway right guys i'm gonna love you and leave you um enjoy the rest of your week stay safe out there don't be an arsewipe because there is enough arsewipes out there without um us lots joining in as well only go out when you need to go out for me that's when i need wine <laughs> it is an essential <laughs> I'll have to make do with gin. Mind you, I've got some amber liquid in there. Some Japanese amber liquid, so. Right then, I'm going to end tonight um, now. And I will uh, see you at some point in somebody's lives. I'll be back next week. Um, take care, everybody. Stay safe.